Hello, and welcome to the Story Partners podcast. We are your hosts, Walt and Annie Manus. We're so glad you're here. We're a team of storytellers who seek to tell stories that point people to Jesus. When we were first married, we were part of a church in Northwest Arkansas. Laura is the wife of our pastor at that church. And this podcast is Laura sharing her own story. The subject matter of this podcast deals with the occult, ritual satanic abuse, and extreme trauma. Although it's a very heavy podcast that covers some really dark topics, we wanted to share this story because ultimately God has the victory in Laura's life. This episode is called, They Took My Body, But Not My Soul. I, um, I wish I had childhood pictures you could see, me and my sisters, three little toe-head blondes, um, and I was the oldest. We were at the Presbyterian Church all the time. My parents sang in the choir, and so when the doors were open, we were there, and I was there. My dad was my nurturing parent. He was so positive for me that my mom felt like she had to even the score. So she turned her affection on the other two girls. She was an alcoholic, and um, that was something we never discussed at all. With my dad, he was raised a Christian scientist, so you don't get sick. I had to be healthy, and I had to be happy, and nothing bad could happen. Because of his belief, there's no such thing as evil. Satan was something that was never discussed in my house. You didn't talk about him, you didn't believe in him. if he was drawn on something, it was the character with the horns and the, and the tail, pitchfork. He was a non-entity. So I grew up with this dual life. For him, I was a happy little girl, but there was this whole dark element in my life My mom had, she had cancer in her uterus. So um, my uh, little sister was born. They had just moved to Richardson, Texas. They didn't know anybody. So um, I was sent to live with my grandparents. My grandmother would go to work and leave me with grandpa. And it was then that I was abused a lot. My grandfather was very culpable and just evil. There was just this awful um, menacing power about him. I was passed around and a lot of abuse took place in Ohio where my grandparents lived. being dressed up like a little hooker and being taken in front of a big group of people, like in a ballroom or something like that. And again, being in this ridiculous adult child sexy outfit and that's what I was there for. And it was awful. I think all this underworld, they're really nefarious and they're connected in different ways. So I was kind of set up as here's a child whose father goes away all the time and the mother is oblivious and we just go in and take her. And you can fly her here or take her here or there and do whatever. I don't know how many other children. I think there are a lot of children that were abused at that time. Satan had the power, at least that's what they thought. And so 
that's the um, idea behind anything satanic. I was in front of uh, a barn full of men, and there may have been women there too, but I remember men, and I can't remember if they were wearing white robes or not, but it was definitely something like that. Inside the barn, things like uh, um, abortions would take place. They want power. Babies would be the purest and the most used because if they're able to sacrifice a child, the younger the better. There's more power. I wasn't enjoying what was being done to me, and I was horrified. You know, you go in and out of consciousness in a situation like that, and that's all of these memories have. It was horrible. And there's been a lot of guilt related to having any association with people like that. I remember one time being taken to Chicago. Coca-Cola was something I was given, probably laced with some kind of drugs, so that I would um, be more cooperative or whatever, and they could just do whatever with me. So going to this hotel in Chicago, being treated in in that hotel like I was a stripper in front of these men, lecherous men, just all manner of physical and um, sexual abuse. And uh, then after that, it just being left uh, in a closet. It was really hard to have a honest, a good opinion about myself. In one situation where I stood naked on a tree stump, and this was in front of the barn, and having um, this molasses kind of tar smeared on my face and my upper body and just feeling really um, this is what they think of me. The Ohio River was so close to where my grandparents lived. I mean, you could see it from their front door. And there was a big bridge. It was very tall, and it spanned the river. My grandfather, in needing to keep me quiet forever, took me on the bridge and held me out over the water and told me he would throw me in if I ever told anybody what was going on. And he threw my little doll in and watching the doll fall. And that was terror, just terror. I don't know where my mind was in all that, just confused completely. And how do you tell your parents that something like that is going on, or your teacher? I don't know, I don't know what the story is behind my parents' neglect and I would think there were plenty of signs that I was not right, that things were going on. I was being passed around at night. I was an emotional and physical mess. But the, here's the dichotomy. I, For my dad, my nurturing parent, I was happy, I was healthy, or I was not accepted. So there was this whole charade going on, horrible things happening to me, 
and then the charade of needing to be this certain way for my dad or um, always being afraid that I was going to cross them some way. They'd be unhappy with me and send me back to be with my grandfather. He would throw me in the river and I would just float off in outer darkness. Did you know that along with this podcast, Story Partners make short documentary films? We do. Come check us out on YouTube and subscribe to our channel to see the latest films as they release. Well, my dad, when I told him about sexual abuse and the incident over the river, the threat of being thrown in, he got really angry and he began to say, that so-and-so, my grandfather. I'd never heard my dad have a disparaging word about my grandfather at all, but he said he's lost all his money in the market crash of 29 and he was a bitter and alcoholic ever since. I wanted to say, then why would you send your little girl to go be watched by him? And that I have no answer to. I know that he and a lot of these people who were using their influence to put me in these positions, they had a connection to the devil. And I think my grandmother did. I'm not positive, but her influence, my dad hated it, hated it. At one point, my grandmother sent a big box of <clears throat> full of occult stuff, uh, just full of it, and kind of explaining why this and that. And um, there became a fascination with that area also. It began to have power in my life, and I, it was scary to me. The Ouija board was a huge influence in my life in junior high and high school. And um, it was crazy. I would work it all by myself, and the spirits would talk to me. The Presbyterian part of me thought, um, there are people who go to heaven, and there are people who go to hell. Who are these people talking to me? Who is this? And who is this, and where do you get your power in this? The Ouija board spelled out Satan. It was awful. Well, I wouldn't touch it from then on. I mean, there was just a... I wanted to burn it, and I guess a lot of people did their Ouija boards. This would have been in the 60s by that point. A lot of abuse took place in Texas. When I went into ninth grade, or right at the very beginning of the school year, um, we had moved to Topeka, Kansas, instead of Richardson. So all these memories from Texas, all those connections were suddenly gone, and there was a deep sense of shame and fear and being a phony, where did all this mixed up stuff come from? I was a sweet little Presbyterian, blonde-headed girl. I don't know how many hours I was in my bedroom. I you would always pray every night, could not pray. That night I just wept. And I was on, got on the floor, and I was just trembling. I was so miserable. And I really felt the fear of 
flying off the end of the earth and just layer after layer I found that you know I was a phony I what was real and what wasn't of what I believed all I knew was I felt very lost very lost and afraid and I feel like I I was feeling like oh I just kind of could I end it all tonight right now and feeling like I that feeling I can't do that and woe is me if I would try to do anything and again memories coming up and grandpa's gonna you know throw me off the Ohio River Bridge and I would fall into this abyss forever and ever and just you know be completely lost eternally and separated from the one I loved the one I believed with all my heart loved me I did not understand I believe there I had to be so good for Jesus and I thought I had eternally separated myself from God there was no hope for me because I I was barely 14 and I had already blown it I didn't understand the gospel So in my misery, I mean, I was clawing at the carpet. I was pulling out my hair. I was just, I don't know where my parents were again. They, we had a split-level house, and they were probably in their bedroom or had the TV on loud or something. But I was all, you know, I was by myself in the bedroom just crying. For the first time, really, I saw myself as a sinner. I saw myself as using his name, using him to, for my own glory. And it was just, it was so horrible in my eyes. I, I really didn't think there was any hope for me. And I just cried out to the Lord, help. And Jesus came to me in the room and stood before me. There had been all this shame. So I still, you know, I couldn't lift my face to look at him, but I, he was there. He was standing there in front of me. I went just violently trembling, and he just communicated to me that he loved me, I was forgiven, I was his forever, and nothing would separate his love from me, and I was safe. His presence just drove away all the shame and guilt and fear, and instead left this wonderful, wonderful peace like nothing I had ever experienced. I saw myself as completely loved, no shame, loved, forgiven, new identity, because he loved me. I told my parents the very next day, and I was transformed. Everything that was phony or fake before that was real. I had a great love for people. I had, you know, just a different outlook on life altogether. Psalm 27 was very dear to me. And the psalmist says, For in the day of trouble he will hide me in the secret place of his tent, and he will um, lift me up on a rock and my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. Oh, I believed that. When I read that passage of scripture, my heart said to thee, O oh Lord, your face I will seek. I remember one night sitting at my desk and uh, 
wanting to pray in tongues. And um, suddenly this very menacing power came over me. And it was all I could do to keep from screaming. It was so horrifying and palpable. And I felt like the Lord said, this is your enemy. Speak to him. And so I did. I just said, in the name of Jesus, you know, I had to say, Satan, get away from me. Get out of this house. Leave me alone. Leave my sisters alone. So seeing power demonstrations like that were really... Uh, God is powerful, and uh, he made his presence so known. Do you have a great story? We're always looking for compelling stories of how God has changed people's lives. If you have a story like this, or if you know of one, let us know. The best way is to reach out by submitting a story on our website at storypartners.org. I found myself drawn when I went to college. I wanted to go to church, but little bit by little bit, um, the first Christians I connected with were from the Church of Christ, and they believed that when you, you must be baptized in their church and believe that it's the act of baptism that saves you. I, would, I went to these Bible studies they held, and they would sing songs, and I just loved it. And I would sing, and my heart just was, you know, was so enthralled with Bible and singing to Jesus. And um, I couldn't figure out their theology very well <laughs> because I knew him. I really knew him. And I wanted them to know that I really knew him, and I wasn't. No, I wasn't water baptized yet, and so forth. So anyway, that was my only connection with Christians until I met my husband. My sister uh, came to the Lord through a Billy Graham movie, and um, I didn't know anything about this until my last semester in college, and she um, was telling me, oh, you need to come to these Bible studies I go to. And there's this man. <laughs> He's been a missionary in Cyprus. And uh, he loves the Lord and he teaches the Bible and you need to come. I went to this Bible study in a barn. I was fascinated because as he would talk, oh, my heart just went out. I mean, he's talking about the same Jesus I worship and has been faithful to me, and this guy knows him too. So there was a connection there that was really strong. Something in me kept indicating that he was going to be my husband, you know, and it was like, no, I, <laughs> he's too old. I graduated from high school in 1970, and Dick graduated in 1960. In my mind, he was dressed pretty nerdy. <laughs> it was hard for me to imagine being interested in a man who wore striped bell-bottom pants. Dick invited me to hear him preach on Sunday, and um, I thought he did that to all the new kids in the Bible study, but he didn't. He was asking me out. So I went to this little Presbyterian church out in the middle of Kansas, and where Dick was uh, speaking, and I remember sitting there in the pew, 
and looking up at Dick as he taught and thinking, this is going to be my life. There were just different things about him that did not make me fall in love with him, but I just had a connection with Dick in Christ that I'd never felt with anybody else, and it was wonderful. Dick has made it clear he would like me to marry him. I, he wanted me for a wife, and I had made it clear to him I did not want to be her, but I, I would pray for Dick. Oh, Lord, he needs a wife so badly, and he did. Lord, provide him a wife, but I don't want to be her. My former boyfriend was um, would have been high society, Topeka, Kansas. They had wealth that most Topekans did not have. And, and so he was very sought after. At his family, coming from old wealth, I knew the Lord was speaking to me. And he said, you could marry and be high society Topeka, Kansas, and be the most miserable woman on the face of the earth. Or you can break up with him and see what I have for you. Dick shared a story of the Lord's provision for him, and it was so exciting. I, My hand went down on his leg, and his hand went down on mine, and he said, What's up? And I... Oh, God, whatever comes out of my mouth, please. This is my life we're talking about. You know, be in my words. And I just told Dick that the Lord had changed my heart. I had a love for him, and I wanted to be his wife. And so Dick said, are we engaged? And I said, well, I, I don't know. I guess we'll see. Anyway... Our love took off from there. We had a wonderful time at the conference. We saw miracles happen right before our eyes. It was wonderful. But Dick and I both, our, our whole attention was really on the fact that we had made this connection and, I, and we were going to stick to it. My life, you know, changed dramatically when Dick and I got married. I had all kinds of hope in Jesus Christ. I had the friendship of the Holy Spirit. I had uh, knowledge of the Bible that I was gaining more and more. And I had wonderful fellowship with friends in Christ. We were students of Scripture. Uh, we obeyed the Holy Spirit if the Lord showed us something we were quick to do it and um, we had people coming in and out of our house at all hours maybe we knew them maybe we didn't but because they loved Jesus and Jesus was drawing people to himself by the bucketfuls it was a wonderful time a wonderful time Are you someone who loves stories and really understands the value in sharing these types of stories? We're looking for people like you to join us in this work. Story Partners is completely crowdfunded, so donations from people like you are how we continue in the work. If you're passionate about this and want to be part of it with us, we invite you to become a regular supporter. Monthly gifts of $20, $30, or even $50 are a massive help in sustaining the ministry month to month. Setting up regular giving is easy on our website at storypartners.org. This friend said, I have I've been given this vision, Laura, and it's of you, and it's a little distressing. And she said, I see a young fruit tree 
all leafed out and had fruit on it and it was small fruit and then and then the fruit tree gets attacked by an axe laid to the heart of the tree and the tree begins to shake and shake and shake and ev- all the all the leaves and fruit everything comes off and the tree itself begins to just cry weep and weep and weep and again it's still shaking how do you react to something like that because I had no immediate witness that was from the Lord but as time went on probably within six months I was my my sanity fell apart, if you will, and I, I really had a mental breakdown emotionally. There was something in me that was trying to come out, and I didn't know what it was, but it was, it was shaking. I thought it, I looked perfectly normal. I was cooking for these young men in the ho- that came to live in the house with Dick and me, and and we had Bible studies twice a week, no, three times a week, and it everything just seemed wonderful. But I was falling apart, and I didn't understand why. And the Lord gave me that same vision in my head, and I saw the young fruit tree. And the axe laid to the heart of the tree, and the tree began to shake and shook and shook and shook. It just kept. That's another thing that that was seen. All the life force of the tree was gushing out until there was nothing there. And the tree just looked dead. Well, that that was such a graphic picture to me and I knew it was the Lord that had given that vision to me. I knew what he, that he was meaning this for good in my life but I couldn't understand it. I just knew I was hurting so badly. No explanation. No one I knew who had an explanation for it. There was the convincing proof of the Holy Spirit and His work in my life, um, the reality of the crucifixion of Christ, and He paid for all this stuff. I didn't understand what the stuff was yet. I had not seen the dragon, but I it was bad, and I knew it was going to be, and everything in me wanted to close that door and not let it out. The horrible thing that was too horrible to see and let out was coming out and I couldn't keep it down. And so I started having these repressed memories and they were repressed. And I honestly didn't know another person who went through anything like what I was going through. Everything was upside down and backwards. I thought I had the best parents in the world. I thought my life was Pollyanna and um, everything good and wonderful from the get-go. And I had blocked, just blocked it all, blocked everything concerning my grandfather. I couldn't even picture him, though I saw him at least twice a year, even into my adulthood, but I couldn't even picture him. I had so blocked him out. I was put in the hospital by my doctor who recognized what was going on and said, she, she's, she's going to fade out of here. She, she doesn't have the energy to even speak. That's true. I was just mummified, if you will. I had this dragon in my basement, and I was scared to death of what it was, what was going to come out and do to me. 
And I was trying with all my might to hold that down, and that, that's a vivid picture of those memories from my childhood that had to come out. And I, I wasn't going to get well until this dragon was able to come out and be seen and, and dealt with. And so the whole process of going through multiple staged breakdowns was um, it's truth coming out and the difficulty of it because my whole body would just shake and be traumatized by these memories that started to come out. So I was put in the hospital and I had met this man. His name was Brad Kaler and he was a wonderful counselor in my life. He was a psychologist. So he was there waiting for me when I got out of the hospital. And we began this arduous journey of looking at what in the world was going on with Laura Ayers. I didn't understand the way the mind works. At that point, you know, um, psychology was still in its infancy. People either go insane with what has happened or they become uh, completely void of understanding of the world because it's too painful to pass. And so you've got people in different stages of coma. My whole world just kind of fell apart. I was not able to talk to people. Dick had to answer the door. Dick had to answer the phone. Um, our good friends, Mark and Gail, uh, took over for us in a good way and cared for people. And Mark would teach, and Dick would be home with me. He did not understand what was going on. He was as confused as I was. I, I was fighting it. I was fighting reality. But reality is real. <laughs> it's real and it would not be denied. I was not able to care for my kids for a while. I mean, I lived at home but and I saw them, but there'd be times when they would want me to comfort them and I'd be crying my eyes out. And Dick would have to say, Mommy can't come and get you right now. I would have these sudden weak spells would come on me and not having even energy to cry out or do anything. And Dick hired two ladies from our church to babysit our kids because I was unable to do it. I would have terrible anxiety attacks. It was all I could do to keep myself from throwing myself out the window and, and ending my life. I cried up to the Lord, Lord, what's, what is going on? It was very scary. He met me with open arms that I could just fall into because it was pure love. The Lord brought me out of the other side. The wave would pass and I'd surface again. It was like a beach ball or something, yet a wave would come and just overwhelm me and push me down. And I had to learn to just relax in it because I always came back up. I've suffered a lot as an adult. The ramifications of all the abuse I went through. There's no cure for chronic fatigue syndrome, which is the presenting debilitation. But... Um, there's, I've just been sick. So a lot of it, I'm sure, was emotional-based. 
and spiritually based. There was anger at my parents, at, at my grandparents, at the world just being the way it is. And but I wouldn't I just couldn't allow myself to blame God. He was so dear to me. You know, he was my lifeline. I was not going to um, push him away. But he loved me and he has been my savior all these years since I was 14 then. I'm 70 now and he has been my savior. He's been my best friend. He's been a good shepherd to me. I've always known he loves me and that's worth everything. It's like been the, the undeniable fact of my life. And I want people who love me to know that so that they're not thinking I am destitute. I've never felt that way. I've been able to have compassion on people who are troubled like this. I've had a gift of healing to people like this and um, because I can see what's going on and, and I can speak to it with confidence that the Lord your antenna may be all out of whack, but God is still sending the same signal. I love you. I love you. I love you. You're forgiven. You are with me for eternity. I have lived through illness and breakdowns and, and church confusion and so forth. He's going to carry me through to the end. Um, I always wondered what going through persecution would be like. And I thought, yeah, I'll probably, as vocal as Dick and I are for the Lord, we may just get chewed up a little before we go to be with the Lord bodily. I'd just as soon not go <laughs> through something like that, but I'm prepared for it. Troubles that come now and have come uh, I know God is going to fix it all. I have such a rosy view of my future. It's hard for people to know where I've come from and how much the Lord has forgiven me and has kept me safe. I want people to know how good the Lord is and how faithful He's been to the promises he gave me that night in my bedroom. He has forgiven me. He does hold me close. He's been with me all the way, even though it's been ugly and it's been scary. I've always known he loves me, and that's worth everything. When I first approached Laura to share this story with us, she eagerly said yes, immediately followed by, I want people to know how good the Lord has been to me. Knowing her story, I was so struck by this response. Her overwhelming testimony is of God's faithfulness and kindness toward her. Laura has a deep understanding of the gospel, of who Jesus is, and of the way he has rescued her. Even after all she has suffered in the past and continues to suffer today, the fruit of peace and joy are all over her life. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. We hope that it encourages you this week. The Story Partners podcast is still very new, but we're already seeing the Lord use it to encourage people. If you've reached out to us to tell us what a specific episode has meant to you, thank you. It really does encourage Walt and I as we continue in this work. If you're willing, we would love for you to take a moment to rate and review the podcast for us. This is a huge help to us as we continue to try to get these stories out to more people. We also wanted to give a big thanks to Elijah Delgado for providing our show music. Elijah is a local artist here in Austin and also our friend. So be sure to check out his work wherever you stream your music. Thank you for listening to this episode. We hope to see you on the next one. Until then.